Hello, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. I see that people are continuing to join. My name is Leslie Humble, and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for QSMA. I wanted to offer a couple of reminders before we get started with today's presentations. Um, first, I want to remind you that the information provided in today's webinar is intended for U.S. audiences only. Secondly, I do want to remind you that, um, as was explained in the registration process, all the questions for today's webinar were asked to be submitted in advance. You will see many of the questions will be answered as part of the presentations from both Genentech and QSMA. And we have pulled out some of the more frequently asked questions as part of smaller Q&As throughout the presentation. Um, for those joining via the web today, um, you will also see a chat box available to communicate with the organizers and ask additional questions. Um, you're welcome to submit questions there as well, um, but know that these questions will not be answered today, but we will catalog them and use them as guidance for future communications. So with those reminders, I am going to pass things off to Kenneth Hobby, president of QSMA, to get us started. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us here today. We're actually going to jump right in. We actually have a lot of information, a lot of slides on um, hopefully very practical information that we're going to present today. So if we want to jump ahead. Um, what I would say to start off though is the, the purpose of this webinar, and we've got QSMA and Genentic on as well, is to try and give the most accurate information that we have available right now to, to everybody that's calling in. There's going to be a lot of personal decisions and choices that you're all going to be looking to make. And it really is kind of your personal uh, choice with your healthcare provider. There's no wrong or right answers, as we always um, have focused on in the SMA community. But our role here is to really give you this accurate information, the best information that we have right now, so that you can make the right choice for yourself. So, so that's something that we'll be doing throughout this. What I did want to say as well, before we jump into a lot of the practical information, is, is just say, and step back a little bit and say a thank you um, and a congratulations to everybody in the community that's been involved in getting this approval and it's a very exciting time for us and so to start off with i did just want to say a thank you to the fda they've been such a good partner to our community for a long time now listening to the patient voice taking that into account when they make their decisions on approvals and so they've really done um, an amazing uh, job working closely with us as a partner over the years and here again they've actually given us something really good. They've given us, again, a very broad label. And so this is something which I think they've done really well in SMA, listening to the patient perspective, understanding what the disease is, looking at the data that comes in. And in this case, again, they come through with a broad label. And what we have for a RISD is a label that is basically for all types, all ages of SMA above two months, and all copy numbers. So really everything above two months all SMA are covered in the label. And that's what we want to try and get from the FDA. And they've done that for us again. And so that's a, a really great thing that we've got. So a thank you to them. Also wanted to say thank you to Genentech, who's going to be on this webinar with us. I'm really saying thank you for them for what they've done with the clinical trials to get to this point. They really took on doing a number of different clinical trials, making sure that they brought into those trials um, a good representation of what the SMA community is, a broad range of patients of ages and types. And that's what helped get that label. And they did this on a global basis as well. And so that was really important to get that really good, broad information together. And Genentech really took that on, listening to the community again, the community's needs. So wanted to thank them. And then also broadly for the whole community, just there's so many different roles that people play in getting to an approval like this. And so I wanted to thank everybody in the community that's, that's had a part getting us to where we are today. Wanted to say a special thank you to the SMA Foundation for what they've done with this particular program, pushing it forward and funding it. There's so many people that have done fundraisers that have helped move the research forward, advocacy efforts, awareness of SMA with local and federal uh, agencies, government, those things have had a role getting us here today as well. And then um, a special thank you as well to everybody that's participated in the clinical trials. There's also focus groups, surveys, information that's come in, but for the people that actually participated in the clinical trials, a very special thank you. There was here again, a placebo control in one of these clinical trials. And that is really important to what we've been able to do in the SMA community. Families, patients going into a clinical trial, taking that risk, knowing that they could go on placebo as well. And that's what's important to get us this, this great information. So the other thing I'll say before we dive in is we're at this point again, where when you get an approval, there's certain rules and regulations that kick in. 
Um, when you get the FDA approval with this label, it does put some boundaries on what can be said. And so you'll probably see that here today. Again, there's certain things that have to be kind of focused on what's in the label, um, who can say what, um, there's certain things that can't be said as well. So sometimes we're not gonna be able to answer all the questions. Um, sometimes an answer might be, no, we don't know yet as well. So it's not just the label, but we don't always have all the information we want. Um, also, this whole call is focused on the US part of this approval. Obviously the drug and how it works is global for everybody in SMA, but the processes that we're talking about, getting access to this treatment are really focused on the US side. And then the final part I'll say is, um, there's a lot of questions that we all have in the community when we're starting to talk about a treatment that we have here and potential combinations and sequences. And that's something which really we won't be able to get into a lot here today because some of these regulations and what's in the label, um, but also, and we'll get to this a little bit later on, it really is an area where we still don't have the information that we need to be able to give those answers, give kind of the quality of information in that area. So we'll talk about it a little bit, but there's not really a lot there quite yet. So the first thing that we're really focused on in the near term after this approval is for us, the key issue right now is gonna be insurance coverage and the, the efforts that we have to do to make sure that we get good insurance coverage from payers for this treatment. And so if we go to the next slide. We've done a lot of work over the last few years in raising awareness um, and just education on what SMA is with the big providers, the big insurance covers um, in the US. Um, and it took a lot of work to get to that point to actually for them to understand what SMA was, how the genetics worked, and what were the needs were of the patients. And we've done a lot of that. And so I think we're really well set up at this point for, for this treatment, for things to move quickly, um, for us to again work with the payers and we work with big commercial groups and then all of the state Medicaid programs as well. And we think this is gonna move pretty quickly and move well because of all this legwork that we've done in the past to get coverage in place and get policies in place. We've actually already done a lot over the last week. We've probably done about 150 letters and emails that have gone out again to all of those big commercial, every single state, the governors of the states as well. And what we really ask for, and what we're looking for is for the policies when they come out, for them to match up to the FDA label. That's what we're looking for these payers to, to cover. So again, we've got the broad label, basically all SMA over two months. That's what we're looking for policies to come in and say that they'll cover as well. Wanted to say here that our expectation is that we're probably not gonna see a lot in any policies that will give kind of coverage for any combinations at this point in time. And again, that comes down to the data that's out there. There really isn't the data that we can use, that we can give to the payers that would kind of make sure that that's covered in these policies. So as an expectation, it really probably is that that's not gonna be there, but we do expect some really good progress and good coverage and we'll probably get a few restrictions, but we hope this will move pretty quickly to get coverage according to the FDA label for Everisd. We'll be tracking these policies over the next few weeks and months as they come out and we'll be sharing that information as well with everybody. So this really is, I think in our mind, the big access part that we've got to focus on for this particular treatment. Um, there's some other steps to go through and one of the key ones is kind of the prescription part for getting onto this treatment. We are working with all the HCPs, the healthcare professionals that we have as well, connected in our community, um, making sure that they're up to speed. We have a webinar that we're doing with them um, in two days to get them up to speed on, on what we're doing in this new treatment. That's the key part in kind of the pathway, the steps to getting access to have that prescription and have HCPs involved and ready to move as well. But one of the things that I think a lot of people already get, and you'll hear a lot of details on in this webinar is the hospital care center part isn't involved so much in getting access to this treatment because it's delivered at home. And so that is something that we don't have to go through. And so that's, that's something why we think access is gonna move pretty quickly here. This is a treatment that is delivered at home. So if we go to the next slide. I wanted to highlight some of the, the specific ways that you can look at this particular treatment, um, which maybe will give some kind of ideas on how it works, what it is that you've got to pay attention to in the benefits and risks, how this drug works, what it does in the body, and how it's delivered as well. And so one thing to start off with is that this is a treatment which is what we call disease altering. It goes to the genetics of what's happening with SMA. So we look at it as a disease altering treatment, which is great, this is what we aim for. We want treatments that go to the genetic causes, the underlying genetics 
rather than just focusing on the symptoms that we see. And this is a treatment that does this by working on the backup gene, that SMN2 gene. That's what this drug is targeted towards. And so it works on a pathway of going towards that backup gene, the SMN2, and increasing the protein, the SMN protein that we need that's lacking in SMA. And so that's the way that this works. Um, one of the things then that comes in is, okay, there's a big questions on combinations of treatments and sequential treatments. But it's, I think, important there to kind of put this particular treatment in that bucket of disease altering. And we'll come to later on then how that could work in a combination where the possible benefits might be if you're combining treatments. But it's important to know that this is one that works on those underlying genetics. So the other part I, I think is very interesting and to kind of bear in mind as we go through this is this is a small molecule drug. It's a small molecule treatment. And I'll try and describe a little bit about what that is, but then why that's important. Um, it, it influences an awful lot of what you need to kind of evaluate when you're making decisions on the benefits and the risks. You need to look at the efficacy, how this actually gives benefits. Um, what are some of the safety, the side effects as well? You're going to have to kind of weigh those two things up. And then critically, what's different with this as small molecule is how it's administered. And so when we say small molecule drug, what we're really saying is that in biology terms, this is something that's actually quite tiny. When you think about proteins, they're very big in the body. This is something which is very small, and we just try to kind of put up the chemical structure there. But, but just think of it that way, that it's very small in terms of your body. So what this means is that you can actually take this orally, which is one of the huge things with this drug. So because it's so small, you can take it orally. It'll go into your digestive system, into your blood, throughout your whole body, and then critically for us, cross over the blood-brain barrier and get into the spinal cord. That's what's really key here, that you can go all the way through that pathway, take it by mouth as a liquid oral, and it will eventually get to where we want it, the, the motor neurons in the, in the central nervous system. And that happens because it's small like that. So this is key. This is really important to us. Um, one of the aspects that I'm saying there to bear in mind then is because you're taking it orally and it goes into your blood, it's going everywhere in the body. And so it does cross into the, the CNS, into the, the motor neurons where we know we need it. That's the critical part. We need it. But it also goes to other places in the body. Um, and I think there's two things to bear in mind and when you're thinking about that. So we know critically in SMA, we've got to get things on this genetic part into the motor neurons. That's where the big main key problems are in SMA. But there's questions on our other, other things in the body that are going wrong because of SMA. It's not completely kind of determined yet. There's still some questions on that. Um, but the signals of that might be the case. And so here you've got a drug that does go everywhere. And so if there are other issues that are being caused by SMA, this now has the potential to help those as well. So that's something important to bear in mind. I wanted to make sure there when we're saying that we're, we're in some ways not talking about those symptoms again. We're still talking about things that are caused directly by SMA, the lack of that SMN protein. We'll come to the symptoms and the muscles later. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about if there's a lower level of SMN protein, in any other parts of the body that could have issues as well. This treatment has the chance to go there and, and have an impact on that as well. What this also brings in though is this is everywhere. And so you've got to watch is this treatment, is this drug having an impact in other areas of the body that you might not want? And we'll get to some of the, those areas as well. Some of that as well comes from this being what I put up there as um, an artificial chemical. This is man-made. Um, it's not something which is in the body naturally. And so these drugs, small molecules, they're really designed as specifically and targeted as possible to do what you want. In this case, it's the SMN2 backup gene. But sometimes because it's man-made, they do other things in the body as well. And those are kind of the side effects that you'll, you'll want to pay attention to and hear about as well. And so this is kind of on target for SMA, SMN, the backup gene. And then look at the off target, other parts of the body that could get affected and then other parts of biology where this might have an impact as well with side effects. Another good thing with kind of these small molecules is they can get made very quickly. And so we're, we're hoping to see here and you'll hear some more on how quickly this can get rolled out with it being available. Um, the oral part of this being available again opens up this opportunity where this can now be delivered at home rather than in a hospital, either inpatient or outpatient setting. This can come right to your home because you can take it orally. Um, and then it's self-administered. You're, you're able to kind of deliver this yourself. And so it's great, very important. That's something to bear in mind. There's some new aspects that we're all going to have to learn with this. And, and I put in here kind of the compliance and the longevity. 
And so there, meaning you've got to take this every day. Another aspect of small molecule drugs is that they go in and they go out of the body very quickly. And so you've got to keep taking this. You've got to make sure that you kind of follow those guidelines, follow the compliance of when you take this and how frequently you take it as well. And that's going to be very important here. So if we go to the next slide. We'll get into this presentation into a lot of these areas, trying to give you information to make, make the decisions, the choices that you have to. And here, I just wanted to kind of outline where you're gonna see information coming from. So there's definitely the clinical trials that are being done. Um, and these are the parts that really are gonna give you that efficacy data. You're gonna see that from the clinical trials, along with the safety data in humans as well that comes from those. There's a number of trials that have been completed but they may kind of have extensions. We may kind of track some of the patients that have been in those clinical trials for longer term as well. And there's a few trials that are still ongoing to, to expand some of the information that we have. When you're looking at the clinical trial data, it's always important to make sure that when you're looking, always have in the back of your mind, the types of the SMA patients, the ages that were in those particular clinical trials, and look at what specific measurements were used on the, the benefit efficacy side to show what the drug's actually doing, how it's changing SMA. Pay attention to those aspects of who was in the trials and how it was measured. There's also preclinical data, which I think is mostly important for safety. It's not really the efficacy. We've got human efficacy that trumps everything, but here the preclinical is in animals and you wanna kind of look and it, it paints a bit of a broader picture on some of the safety data. So, so we'll go over some of that as well. What we will need, and we don't have it yet though, is what we call real world evidence. We're gonna need more than we just have now for the longer term. We're gonna to want to know kind of how this works five years from now. We're gonna to want to get this information that's gonna help us figuring out possible sequences of treatments, combining them together as well. And again, I'll say here right now, we don't have that. Um, there's some regulations that cover what we're gonna talk about today, but it's also the availability of that data, that information, which isn't at hand yet. So we're not gonna be able to give good answers, good guidance, in these areas yet, the long-term combination is sequential. I think the one thing that we'd highlight just on the combination part is something we've been saying for a while, which is, you know, our high level overview would be that if you're, if you're looking at treatments which do mostly kind of the same thing, mostly kind of the genetics, maybe in different ways, but are all building towards genetics to building up that SMN protein, we look at them as kind of one big bucket, this really good disease altering treatments. We don't know if it's gonna make a lot of sense if you're gonna get a lot of extra benefit at the price maybe of sometimes some extra risk to combine those together, which work in very much kind of the same ways compared to if you combine drugs that work in very different ways. And so there we're really kind of talking at a high level combining a disease altering genetic treatment with something then that might work on say the muscles, the symptoms, work in very different ways. Will you get more bang for the buck with less risk by combining things like that? And that's something we're just gonna see over time. The coverage will factor in probably in the short term in some of the decisions and the choices here. We really are kind of very focused that we want that out of the way for all patients, families, as you're making choices. We don't want the insurance coverage to factor in, put restrictions in place. And so we wanted to match the FDA label. And then that really is kind of taken out of the picture when you're deciding uh, about this treatment. We'll have to work through that. It takes a little bit of a while uh, to, to kind of get these policies in place, but we hope that'll move quickly and then that'll be a non-issue. Uh, as we go forward. And then finally, for when you're thinking about decisions, choices, definitely the delivery here is a big factor. It, it's something kind of very different for us to get our hands around. All the, the clinical trial benefits, safety, that's there. Here, the fact that this is delivered at home rather than in a hospital setting is kind of a key part. So then the next slide, just following on from that, um, thought a little bit. Um, this is a treatment at home which is, it, it, it's got a great aspect to it. What we wanted to stress here as well, and, and Mary Schroth, when she comes on, will talk a little bit more about this as well, is that's great, we've got a treatment at home, but there's other aspects of SMA that we still have to pay attention to that are still very important. We don't have a cure here. This is a really good treatment, but it does mean that we still have issues of SMA going on. You can't ignore those. And it's actually very important to still pay attention to what SMA uh, is still doing, even though things are going better. And so you've got to kind of stay focused on staying healthy with what is still going on with SMA. What you also have to still stay focused on is making the most out of a disease altering treatment like this. That if this has gone in and worked on the genetics, worked on those motor neurons, doing things at that level, there's still work that needs to be done, whether it's with physical therapy, nutrition, aspects like that, 
to help bring back strength even eventually what we're talking about here, combination treatments that might work on the muscles, is kind of that combination that really is important to focus on here. So care to stay healthy, care to make the most out of the, the treatment here as well. We also are gonna to need to get this information on, on the long term of how this treatment works five years, 10 years from now, and potentially in combinations. So we're going to, as a community are gonna to have to find out a way of looking at this great benefit here of a treatment at home. We're still balancing the need for access to this care part and collecting this information going in potentially to care centers and hospitals. But I think one thing we're dealing with now as well is looking at those opportunities for, for telehealth as well to do that virtually. And so there's definitely gonna be more coming. This is a first step. Um, there'll be more webinars over time as well as things build up. We're gonna get more information, more learnings, um, more answers to the questions that we all have in the community and that'll come. But we do have a lot of information here today that we have on hand now. So I'm actually gonna turn this over now and welcome Alana in from Genentech who's gonna kick us off with Genentech's part of the presentation. So welcome, Alana. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And thanks to all of you who joined us today for today's webinar to learn more about FRISD. I also wanna take a moment to thank the QSMA team who's working behind the scenes um, to put on this webinar today. I can see um, there is about 753 people who've joined so far uh, and a lot of work goes on behind the scenes to make this happen. So thanks to the staff of QSMA. Um, as Kenneth mentioned, my name is Alana Paul, and I am a member of Genentech's Patient Advocacy Relations Team. On behalf of both the Genentech and Roche teams who've supported this approval, I can't tell you how excited we are to share the details of EVRISD and our support services over the course of the presentation. But before we get to that, I do need to mention a few disclaimers. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the program that's being presented today on behalf of Genentech and it, the information presented is consistent with FDA guidelines. This program is intended to provide general information about FRISD, molecule name Rizdaplam, and not m medical advice for any particular patient, as Kenneth alluded to. This program is intended for US audiences only. We're going to be covering the FDA approved label specific to the US of FRISD. Any adverse events included in the presentation today have already been reported to Genentech US Drug Safety and no action is required by any member of the audience. This program may be monitored by Genentech for adherence to program requirements. And lastly, all materials shared today are the property of Genentech and may not be recorded, photographed, copied, or reproduced with the caveat that QRSMA is recording this webinar um, and is going to be making it available uh, for those of you who are on the line and also those who are not able to make it. So next slide, please. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about what we're gonna to cover today. In just a moment, I'm going to pass the presentation over to my very good friend and colleague, Travis Dickendesher, who's going to walk you through an overview of EVRISD, including the indication statement, an explanation of how EVRISD is designed to work, and then he's going to explain the clinical trial data results which demonstrate the efficacy of EVRISD in infants, children, children, and adults. Lastly, he will explain how to take EVRISD, and then we'll pause and Travis will answer a number of the pre-submitted questions that you've sent in ahead of time. Then I'll spend a bit of time explaining the unique resources that we have created to support patients and families that are both interested in learning more about FRISD or have been prescribed the drug. We will then address a few more pre-submitted questions before concluding our section of the webinar. But before we get started, I do wanna take a moment to express our heartfelt thanks to CureSMA for this opportunity and also to you, the SMA community, that has really welcomed us in over the last several years, and without which the approval of this medicine would not have been made possible. We know that taking part in a clinical trial is a huge commitment. There's additional healthcare visits and screenings involved, and are so grateful for the more than 450 patients that are involved in our clinical trials. And we know you haven't done it alone. Your families have supported you, driving you, and just being part of the process. A huge thank you to all of you. The way we designed our trial trial program and ultimately the name of RISD represents that this drug is for everyone who is covered by the label. Every for ev everyone and then ZD to have our RISD plan as part of our name finally. 
One other note, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from colleagues about how much they've learned from their in-person experiences, whether chatting over coffee at the annual QSMA uh, conference with a family or meeting so many adults at various summits of strengths, walk and rolls, and hopes on the hill. Each of these interactions have really helped us understand the needs of the community better and impacted how we both designed our clinical trials and our services. We commit to continue to learn from you at these events, probably in their virtual equivalent for the near future. So please keep the feedback coming. So thanks to all of you who've joined us on the journey that led to August 7th, our approval day, um, and today and to Cure SMA for all of their work on behalf of the community. So without further ado, let's move on to our presentation. Take it away, Travis. All right, well, thank you so much, Alana. Um, as Alana mentioned, my name is Travis Dickendasher, and I'm a Senior Medical Science Director for SMA at Genentech. Uh, it really is my pleasure to speak here today, and I'm gonna be discussing with you the overall profile of EVRISD, or RISDIPLAM, including the safety and effectiveness of the medicine based on clinical trials. Uh, next slide. So uh, as I think everyone attending this webinar is aware, Evrisd was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration on August 7th of this year to treat spinal muscular atrophy in patients two months of age and older. More specifically, Evrisd is a prescription medicine used to treat SMA in adults and children two months of age and older. And it is not known if Evrisd is safe and effective in children under two months of age. Uh, next slide. So there are some important pieces of safety information that I want to share up front. Uh, so before taking Evrisd, tell your healthcare provider about all of your medical conditions, including if you have liver problems, if you are pregnant or plan to become pregnant, and if you are pregnant or plan to become pregnant, ask your healthcare provider for advice before taking this medicine. Evrisd may harm your unborn baby. Um, tell your healthcare provider if you're a woman who can become pregnant, and before you start your treatment with Evrisd, your healthcare provider may test you for pregnancy. Because Evrisd may harm your unborn baby, your healthcare provider will decide if taking a RISD is right for you during this time. Um, also talk to your healthcare provider about birth control methods that may be right for you. Use birth control while on treatment and for at least one month after stopping a RISD. Tell your healthcare provider if you're an adult male planning to have children. A RISD may affect a man's ability to have children. And if this is of concern to you, make sure you ask a healthcare provider for advice. And tell your healthcare provider if you are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. It is not known if Evrisd passes into breast milk and may harm your baby. If you plan to breastfeed, discuss with your healthcare provider about the best way to feed your baby while on treatment with Evrisd. Next slide. Uh, tell your healthcare provider about all the medicines you take, including prescription and over the counter medicines, vitamins and herbal supplements. Keep a list of them to show your healthcare provider and pharmacist when you get a new medicine. You should receive Evrisd from the pharmacy as a liquid that can be given by mouth or through a feeding tube. The liquid solution is prepared by your pharmacist. If the medicine in the bottle is a powder, do not use it. Contact your pharmacist for a replacement. And avoid getting Evrisd on your skin or in your eyes. If Evrisd gets on your skin, wash the area with soap and water. And if Evrisd gets in your eyes, rinse your eyes with water. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I would like to discuss um, how Evrisd is designed to work. So SMA is caused by either deletion or mutation of the survival of motor neuron one or SMN1 gene, which in turn leads to a reduction in the critical SMN protein. There is a backup gene called SMN2, but most of the protein produced by SMN2 is not functional. So altogether, there are insufficient levels of SMN protein. Evrisd is designed to act on SMN2 to help make and maintain SMN protein. 
In fact, in clinical trials with FRISD, median SMN protein levels more than doubled within four weeks of starting FRISD. These increased levels of SMN protein were maintained throughout 12 months of studies across all SMA types. Um, an additional point to highlight, in animal studies, Evrisdi was shown to be distributed throughout the body. Next slide. Okay, so let's turn now to the clinical trial experience with Evrisd. Evrisd is being studied in more than 450 people living with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. This includes infants two months of age and older, children, <clears throat> excuse me, and adults with SMA. So our discussion today will focus on the firefish and sunfish pivotal studies, studies to assess the safety and effectiveness of Evrisd. I will briefly outline them here and then go into more detail in a moment. So firefish is a two-part study that includes infants two to seven months of age with type 1 SMA. Sunfish is also a two-part study and includes children and adults two to 25 years of age with type two or three SMA. In addition to firefish and sunfish, jewelfish is an ongoing supportive study assessing the safety of Evrisd in people with type one, two, or three SMA from one to 60 years of age who were previously treated with other SMA medications. Um, of note, this is the first SMA clinical trial program to include patients over 18 years of age. Uh, next slide. Um, so now I'm gonna further discuss uh, the results from the Firefish study in infants with type one SMA. Next slide. Um, as I previously mentioned, Firefish is a two-part study. It includes 62 infants with type one SMA all receiving Evrisd treatment, with part one including 21 infants, three to seven months of age, and part two including 41 infants, two to seven months of age. Today I'm gonna to be focusing on the part one findings. So part one of Firefish explored the recommended dose of Evrisd for people in this age group. The study measured safety and the effectiveness of Evrisd. In particular, the study looked at the ability of infants to sit without support for at least five seconds, as well as survival without permanent breathing support after 12 months of Evrisd treatment. So now let's look at some of these results. Uh, next. So motor function in Firefish Part 1 was measured using one item from a tool called the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development, third edition. This item is the ability to sit without support for at least five seconds. Untreated infants with type 1 SMA are not expected to be able to sit without support. In Firefish Part 1, 41% of the infants taking the recommended dose of Evrisd for 12 months were able to sit without support for at least five seconds. Thus, Evrisd helped infants achieve a key motor milestone. Next slide. So here we're looking at the percentage of infants in Firefish Part 1 that were alive without permanent breathing support at 12 months and at 23 months. So first I wanna define what we mean by permanent support. Um, permanent support was defined as one, having a tracheostomy, a surgery where a tube is inserted in the front of the throat into the windpipe, or two, having more than 21 consecutive days of either non-invasive ventilation support or intubation in the absence of an acute reversible event. So intubation being a procedure where a breathing tube is inserted down the throat and into the windpipe. So at 12 months, 90% of all infants taking Evrisd were alive and could breathe without permanent support. At 23 months of Evrisd treatment, 81% of all infants were alive and could breathe without permanent support. Next slide. So here we have some additional observations from the Firefish Part 1 study related to eating and swallowing. 
Uh, important to mention is that this information is considered exploratory. So it was not designed to show a treatment effect. So conclusions cannot be drawn from these observational data. Out of the infants taking the recommended dose of Evrisd for 12 months, 88% or 15 out of 17 infants were able to eat by mouth. Of the 15 infants who could eat by mouth, two of them could eat some food by mouth, but also used a feeding tube. In addition, 88% were able to swallow. And it should be noted that of the 17 infants included in this analysis, one infant could not swallow at the start of the study. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna move from firefish to a discussion of the results from the sunfish study in children and adults with type two or three SMA. Next. As I previously mentioned, sunfish is a two-part study. It is placebo controlled, meaning that for a portion of the study, some participants receive Evrisd, while others receive placebo, a substance that has no uh, active medicine. Sunfish includes 231 children and adults with type two or three SMA with part one, including 51 participants, two to 24 years of age, and part two, including 180 participants, two to 25 years of age. Both parts of the study include participants with and without scoliosis, as well as with and without joint contracture. Part one includes some participants able to walk and some not able to walk, whereas part two only includes participants not able to walk. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on the part two findings. So part two of Sunfish measured the safety and effectiveness of Evrisd. In particular, the study looked at the change in motor function after 12 months of Evrisd treatment compared with those not taking Evrisd. This was assessed using the motor function measure 32 or the MFM 32, which I will describe next. Um, of note, 120 of the 180 total participants in Sunfish Part 2 have scoliosis, including 57 with severe scoliosis. Next slide. So here's more information on the MFM32 scale, which evaluates 32 different elements and is designed to capture change for a broad range of people. The MFM32 scale measures motor function abilities that relate to important daily functions, grouped into three categories, standing and transfer movements, upper and lower body movements, and hand and foot movements. Next slide. Now here are the MFM32 results over 12 months of the Sunfish Part 2 study, comparing Evrisd treatment to the placebo group not receiving Evrisd. When looking at the average change in MFM32 score from the start of the study to 12 months, children and adults treated with Evrisd showed improved motor function compared with those not taking Evrisd. For those receiving Evrisd treatment, the average score increased 1.36 points, whereas in those not receiving Evrisd, the average score decreased 0.19 points. Uh, next. Another assessment in Sunfish Part 2 was the revised upper limb module, or ROLM, which measures upper limb strength by evaluating the performance of daily tasks. Some of these tasks are listed on this slide and include picking up tokens, using a pencil, raising a cup to the mouth, opening a container, and lifting and moving weights, to name a few examples. Next slide. Now here are the Rome results over 12 months of the Sunfish Part 2 study, comparing Evrisd treatment to the placebo group not receiving Evrisd. When looking at the average change in Rome total score from the start of the study to 12 months, children and adults treated with Evrisd showed improved upper limb function compared with those not taking Evrisd. For those receiving Evrisd treatment, there was an average increase of 1.61 points whereas in those not receiving Evrisd, there was an average increase of 0.02 points. 
Next slide. Okay, so now that we've discussed the effectiveness of EVRISD in the Firefish and Sunfish trials, let's turn to some additional safety information. Next. So the safety of EVRISD is being studied in infants, children, and adults from two months to 60 years of age with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. In infants with type 1 SMA, the most common side effects include fever, diarrhea, rash, upper respiratory infection, which would include runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, and cough, um, as well as lung infection, constipation, and vomiting. In children and adults with type 2 and 3 SMA, the most common side effects include fever, diarrhea, and rash. These are not all of the possible side effects of Avrisd. For more information on the risk and benefits profile of Avrisd, ask your healthcare provider or pharmacist. Um, after 12 months in the main clinical studies, no one stopped taking Avrisd because of side effects. The safety of Avrisd in people previously treated with other SMA medications is currently being studied. And you may report side effects to the FDA or to Genentech using the contact information listed on this slide. Next slide. Okay, so next I'm gonna say a few words about how to take EVRISD. Next. So EVRISD is the first and only medicine to treat SMA with at-home dosing. The shipment is delivered directly to your door and contains a one month supply. Evrisd is a liquid that is stored in the refrigerator. The dose is measured using the oral syringe provided and it is taken once a day by mouth or feeding tube. A few other things to mention, um, your healthcare provider will determine the right dose for you based on age and weight and always take the dose exactly as prescribed. Um, you can administer Evrisd to yourself or with the help of the person who takes care for you. Um, it should be taken around the same time each day after a meal. And these are not the full dosing instructions for Evrisd. So you can talk to your healthcare provider to learn more about Evrisd and read the full patient information and instructions for use that come with a prescription before taking the first dose. Uh, next slide. So now I'm just gonna summarize the information that I shared with you today. So Evrisd or Rizdaplam is approved to treat SMA in adults and children two months of age and older. It improved motor function scores in two main studies of infants, children, and adults. In the Firefish Part 1 study, 41% of the infants taking the recommended dose of Evrisd were able to sit for at least five seconds without support after 12 months. 90% of infants at 12 months and 81% of infants at 23 months were alive and could breathe without permanent support. In the Sunfish Part 2 study, motor function improved in children and adults after 12 months. Um, in addition, Evrisd increased and maintained SMN protein levels throughout the 12 months of clinical studies. The safety of Evrisd is being studied in people two months to 60 years with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. And Evrisd is the first and only oral treatment for SMA that is delivered to your door. And again, as far as important safety information, before taking Evrisd, tell your doctor if you have liver problems are pregnant or plan to become pregnant, or are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. Evrisd may harm an unborn or breastfed baby. Evrisd may affect a man's ability to have children and tell your doctor about all the medicines you take. Next slide. Okay, so now that we've discussed the safety, effectiveness, and dosing of Evrisd, uh, we're gonna pause here and I'll address questions that you all submitted ahead of this webinar. Um, importantly, we're not here to provide medical advice, and so you should always speak with your healthcare provider regarding treatment decisions. 
Thank you, thank you, Travis. Um, again, that was great information, and Curious May wanted to take a quick pause here to answer a few of the questions submitted by the community with their registration. Um, so the first question we had today is, what has been found regarding the effect of, of RISD on pre-symptomatic infants? Sure. So participants enrolling in the Firefish, Sunfish, and Jewelfish clinical trials with FRISD were symptomatic. Um, there is, however, an ongoing clinical trial to investigate the effectiveness and safety of FRISD in infants from birth to six weeks who have been genetically diagnosed with SMA but are not yet presenting with symptoms. Um, no data is yet available from this pre-symptomatic study. Um, and it, just as a reminder, the FRISD prescribing information states that FRISD is indicated for the treatment of SMA in patients two months of age and older, and it does not include any statement on patients being symptomatic versus pre-symptomatic. Thank you. Um, so if a person is currently on Spinraza, is there an amount of time that they must wait before they start Evrisd? Yes. Yeah, so the Evrisd prescribing information does not provide guidance um, on the use of Evrisd in relation to Spinraza or other SMA medications. Uh, what I can say is that in the Jewelfish clinical trial, which is assessing the safety of Evrisd in people with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA, who were previously treated with other medications, participants needed to receive their last dose of Spinraza at least 90 days prior to screening uh, for the trial. Um, as previously mentioned, though, you should always consult with your healthcare provider when making decisions uh, related to treatment. Great, um, and for children who have received Zolgensma, um, and benefit, are they eligible to also have treatment with FRISD? Sure. So, yeah, this is really a two part question. So, there's eligibility and then benefit. So, in terms of eligibility, um, the FRISD prescribing information, you know, does not preclude the use of another SMA medication prior to FRISD treatment. Um, we cannot speak to eligibility as far as insurance coverage, as this depends on a patient's ins insurance coverage and benefit plan. Um, in terms of benefit, there are no data available on the benefit of FRISD in patients who have previously received other SMA medications. Um, and again, this ongoing Jewelfish trial in people with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA previously treated with other SMA medications, this trial is focused on safety. And any measures of effectiveness are exploratory and, and not the main focus of that study. Thank you. Um, and then the last question, which you touched a bit on in your presentation, does a RISD affect female or male fertility? In other words, the ability to have children? Sure. So, so with this question, there, there are really three main points that I want to emphasize. Um, the first is that there is no data from human studies on a RISD's impact on fertility. So all the fertility references in the prescribing information are based on animal studies uh, not human studies. Um, second, based on these animal studies, there was no observed impact of Evrisdi on female fertility. Uh, but again, if you're a woman who can become pregnant, your healthcare provider may test you for pregnancy because Evrisdi may harm your unborn baby. And also you should talk to your healthcare provider about birth control methods that may be right for you and use birth control while on treatment and for at least one month after stopping Evrisd. Um, and then the third point is that studies conducted in rats showed that mature male rats experienced blockage of sperm production, and the resulting effects were only partially reversible. Um, similar effects could not be fully evaluated or established in monkey studies where the animals were younger and not yet capable um, of producing sperm. So FRISD may affect a man's fertility, and if you're an adult male planning to have children, make sure to ask a healthcare provider for advice. And with that, then I think we'll turn it back over to Alana. Great. Thank you, Travis. 
I apologize, I was having some technical difficulties. Just a moment. Okay, so now I'm gonna spend a few minutes describing our support services that we've created under the umbrella of what is called My SMA Support. Uh, next slide, please. Before I do so, I wanna mention our overall commitment to patients, which was the backbone of why we created My SMA Support for at RISD. Since we first started providing access and reimbursement support almost 20 years ago, Genentech has helped more than 2.2 million patients across access the Genentech medicines they need. While our primary focus and grounding is in developing breakthrough medicines for serious illnesses, we are equally committed to helping the people who need these medicines get them in a smooth and efficient manner. Next slide, please. So let's take change gears and talk a little about my SMA support and how we're going to do that. This program includes services in support of patients uh, throughout every step of their EBRISD journey, from providing initial product education either prior to or after being prescribed EBRISD to understanding the insurance and financial assistance options available. We also work to coordinate delivery of EBRISD with you in coordination with the specialty pharmacy at Credo. All of these services are provided by the MySMA support team of which the patient and access liaisons or PALS are your main point of contact and available in your community to help. Next slide, please. Again, the PALS are the local main points of contact from Genentech who will be supporting people living with SMA. They work with the rest of the MySMA support team to help you throughout the treatment journey. So let's talk a little bit more about what else the PAL does to assist. They can answer questions that you have about EBRISD, including much of what Travis just covered on how the product works, how to take it, and explain the results we saw in clinical trials. They can also explain important safety information. Once prescribed EBRISD, PALS are available uh, to help you navigate insurance coverage and financial support options and refer you to other helpful resources. While PALS will not fill out or submit prior authorizations or appeals, they will work with our field-based NRD TAM team who will be directly assisting healthcare providers in the process. And of course, they're available to, available to assist you based on your preferences, whether that be in person or my, more likely these days virtually. Next slide, please. Now, throughout the process, there are other MySMA support team me members that are working behind the scenes, which you might come in contact with, including EBRISD case managers, who will work closely with your PAL and healthcare provider office to help you better understand coverage and financial support options, and partner with the specialty pharmacy to ensure smooth delivery of treatment. Next slide, please. And that leads us to the last part of the MySMA support team, Acredo, which is the specialty pharmacy that prepares and ships Evrisdi directly to you each month. Should you be prescribed Evrisdi, Acredo will call you to coordinate delivery of the product and work with you to find a time that is convenient for that delivery. Each month, you will receive a monthly supply of Evrisdi from Acredo. Now, although Acredo is not part of Genentech and is independent of our company, it is an important part of the MySMA support team and critical to ensuring that you receive Everest in the comfort of your home. Next slide, please. And just to say a few words about financial support options. Financial assistance may be available for eligible patients with commercial insurance, public insurance, or no insurance. Genentech offers the following options to help patients with the out-of-pocket costs of EBRISD. We have a copay program. There are independent assistance foundations. And finally, Genentech Patient Foundation. Each program has its own eligibility criteria. 
that must be met for patients to receive assistance. And of course, your MySMA support team with the PALS at the helm can help you evaluate your options. Next slide, please. So I've spent a bit of time explaining MySMA support, but I wanna end on a few important points. One, MySMA support is a completely voluntary program and enrollment is not required to receive a FRISD. Rather, it is a set of services that is available to fit your needs should you have any interest. For those who are interested in learning more about MySMA support or enrolling in the program or even finding their local PAL, you can either visit the website listed on this screen, www.evrisd.com backslash PAL, and connect with the PAL in your area via our handy zip code, zip code locator, or you can call the number listed on this screen and someone is available to help. Next slide, please. Lastly, I just wanna close by saying that Travis and I have covered quite a bit of information today related to FRISD and our support services. Please keep in mind that each person's treatment goals and needs are individual in nature. So we recommend that you talk to your healthcare provider to learn if FRISD is right for you. So with that, one final thank you for your attention today and I'll turn it back to Leslie. Thanks, thanks, Alana. Um, I know we have a few more questions that we wanted to pose to you um, that were again submitted in advance. The first is about price and how did you determine the price of Everisdi? Sure, so <clears throat> the Everisdi pricing decision was made with the intention to enable access for all appropriate patients with SMA who choose Everisdi in consultation with their HCP. So. Our pricing philosophy at Genentech is anchored in four key components that we consider when determining a price for any medicine. Clinical benefit, patient access, continued investment in our pipeline, and responsibility to patients, society, and shareholders. Great, and as a follow-on to that, um, what is the cost for a FRISD? Sure. So the maximum wholesale acquisition cost of a RISD is $340,000 per year for a patient who is 20 kilograms or more, which is roughly the equivalent to 44 pounds. So this gets a little complicated, so I'm gonna go through the details now. Wholesale acquisition cost is WAC, as I mentioned, is the published list price for a drug to wholesalers or direct purchasers. The actual price paid by purchasers may vary. This is different, typically different from a patient's out-of-pocket cost. The cost to a patient will vary based on the patient's insurance coverage, either commercial, Medicare or Medicaid, and benefit plans. The important thing to remember is that the WAC is determined by dose, which is again determined by the weight and age of the patient taking the medicine. Therefore, for a patient, for example, who weighs less than 20 kilograms, the dose will vary based on their age and weight. For example, an infant who weighs 15 pounds and is less than two years old, the annual wholesale acquisition price for RISD would be less than $100,000 for that year. Again, I wanna emphasize that WAC is typically different from a patient's out-of-pocket cost, which is ultimately determined by insurance coverage. Great, the, the next question is, when will RISD be commercially available? Sure, so when we announced the approval of RISD on August 7th, we committed that the drug would be available commercially within two weeks of approval. We're pleased to share um, that Evrisdi is available this week through Acredo, our specialty distributor. As I mentioned, Acredo is the only specialty pharmacy that prepares and ships Evrisdi directly to patients each month, um, but it is in their hands this, this week. We're happy to report. That's that's great news. Um, will Medicaid and Medicare cover of RISD for adults using invasive permanent ventilation? Yeah, so 
question. Unfortunately, I wish we had a better answer to this one. We just don't yet. Ultimately, as Kenneth mentioned in the beginning, we're at the beginning stages of navigating insurance coverage for this product. So coverage will depend on the policies that Medicare and Medicaid put in place. Our team is in the process of meeting with both private and public payers so they understand the value that Everisd can bring to all patients, including those on ventilation, um, who are eligible for the medicine based on the prescribing information. So more to come on that. Great, and related to insurance coverage, um, can you share the status of insurance coverage for Everisd? Yeah, so similarly, kind of leading up to the Everisd launch and beyond, we've been actively engaging with commercial and government payers to support broad access for all appropriate patients that are covered by the label. And we understand that payers will make their own decisions based on unique considerations and populations, and we continue to work with payers to understand more about SMA and enable access for more appropriate patients. So at this phase, we're in the beginning stage of working with payers, um, and I would say, I know that uh, Kenneth and others are gonna say more about um, how to advocate for your individual situation, um, but we're in the process of speaking with them so that we can enable as broad of access as possible. Great, and our last question is more specifically about Medicare and the status of Medicare approval. Will this approval, when it comes, provide for reimbursement under Part B or Part D? Sure. So we expect, because this is an at-home administered treatment, that Medi Medicare will classify Everisd under the pharmacy benefit, which is Medicare Part D. That said, pharmacy and therapeutics committees of Part D plans review new drugs and they'll make the determination ultimately. And they have 180 days within the approval of a new drug to make that determination. Great, thank you, Alana, for answering those questions and Travis as well um, for his part of the presentation. I know we're at the one hour mark right now, um, so um, we appreciate folks joining. We are going to continue, this is being recorded and um, we will look to share it with the community, but I do wanna pass things off to Dr. Mary Shrove, the Chief Medical Officer for CuraSMA. Um, she'll be presenting along with our CuraSMA's Vice President for Advocacy, Maynard Fries. Thank you, Leslie. Next slide. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be with us today. As Kenneth said earlier, we are so excited to have another treatment to uh, provide to the community. Um, I am going to go through some of these slides quickly. You've already heard multiple times what the indications and usage are. Um, as RISD is approved for people with SMA two months and older, verified by gene mutations or deletions, um, and all SMA types and SMA2 copy numbers. Next slide, please. I wanted to share with you additional clinical trial data um, that um, is not part of the current label. Uh, and um, the first piece I want to share with you is the Firefish uh, Part 2 study, which is infantile onset, two to seven months. This is the efficacy arm of the Firefish study. And this slide shows that there has been progressive improvement in CHOP and 10 scores, which is a me measure of motor function um, over time. So over, um, over 12 months of treatment, there's progressive improvement in the CHOP and 10. And 56% achieved a CHOP and 10 score of greater than or equal to 40 after 12 months of therapy. Uh, on the right side of the slide shows you the natural history of survival um, uh, for SMA. The top is, again, natural history, um, uh, progressive uh, loss of function, um, and early death. Um, and the bottom shows um, the survival in individuals who received uh, EVRSD. 93% of infants were alive at month 12. And this included 41 infants. Next slide. This is preliminary data on the JewelFish tri trial, which is an open label trial in uh, people with SMA who have received other treatments. And those other treatments include Zolgensma, Spinraza, and Alizaxine. Uh, people were six months to 60 years of age um, in this trial. And the early results show that the safety pro profile um, are similar to firefish and sunfish. There were no drug-related safety findings that led to withdrawal from this trial. Um, and what uh, they have um, are, are showing is that this graph shows that the SMN protein level 
following a RISDA plan increased rapidly within four weeks and, uh, and were maintained throughout the study period. Next slide. So I also wanted to review um, the um, administration of, of, of RISD. Um, there are several details that I just wanted to make sure people heard from me. Um, uh, you all know that this is uh, available uh, by mouth or feeding tube. It is daily, and the recommendation is to take it at around the same time every day after a meal uh, um, so that you can maintain the levels uh, of, of, of RISD in your system. Um, it's a refrigerated liquid. It's also weight-based up to 20 kilograms, which is approximately 44 pounds. Um, so the dose will be adjusted until you reach um, a weight of 20 kilograms, if you're under 20 kilograms currently. Max dose is 5 milligrams. It is prescription, physician prescription only, and it's mailed to home or work from a credo. Um, I wanted just to throw out something to people is that if you need to be hospitalized while you're on Evrisd, um, often uh, it will be necessary for you to take Evrisd, your prescription, with you into the hospital. Um, so um, be sure to ask about that um, and or take your medication with you um, when you are anticipating hospitalization. Next slide, please. Safety information um, that Travis uh, shared with you included the adverse events in infants um, and were reported in 10% or more of, of um, those in the Firefish study, and this is 62 patients. Um, uh, colds were very frequently reported, pneumonia, constipation, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, and rash. And then among the older individuals participating, more than 10% reported fever, diarrhea, and rash. Next slide, please. I wanted to spend a little bit um, more time, sort of a, a little bit different spin from the QSMA side regarding um, uh, these, the safety considerations. And uh, first and foremost, please discuss um, uh, these considerations with your healthcare provider. Your neuro neuromuscular team will be able to help you um, in your decision making. Um, so the first issue is female fertility and pregnancy. As you heard Travis say, female fertility um, is not affected based on animal data. Currently, there's no human data on pregnancy or effects on the fetus. Um, and uh, what we are looking at is the safety data that is standard when looking at uh, new medications that are coming to market. Um, so based on what we know currently, which again, there's no human data available to, um, to help, but um, the most conservative position and the safest is to consider screening for pregnancy before starting and use birth control while, while on Evrisd and for one month after stopping Evrisd. Um, for breastfeeding, again, there's no human data. Uh, the recommendations are to avoid breastfeeding while on Evrisd at this time because, again, we just don't have enough information. Um, in male fertility, uh, again, no data on humans. However, in animal studies, mature males um, had impaired sp sperm production, so they had a lower sperm uh, account. Um, there was no effect on sexually immature males. Um, so the recommendation currently is um, uh, to really consider the risk versus benefit of starting this medication. Uh, consider if you are um, uh, an adult male, consider sperm pr preservation prior to starting treatment. And again, please discuss these thoroughly with your healthcare provider. Um, regarding liver, um, there, there's no data regarding liver. Um, however, we know that the RISD is metabolized through the liver. So the recommendation is that if there's no liver disease, um, uh, elevated liver function tests um, to not take RISD. Uh, and again, please discuss with your healthcare provider. Um, what we have learned is that uh, FRISD can interfere with the metabolism of medications that use a particular pathway for metabolism, uh, and that pathway is called MATE. Um, uh, and um, medications that use MATE are uh, metformin, uh, which is typically an adult um, medication, um, cimetidine or tagamet, uh, and ciprofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones um, in that category of antibiotics. Uh, and what happens is that um, uh, Evrisd interferes, again, with their, the metabolism of those other drugs, so they will be at higher levels in the body. 
Uh, and the recommendation is avoid using medications that use this mate uh, uh, pathway to metabolize the drug. Um, uh, and if if the med if the medication that requires the mate pathway um, is needed, um, the medication levels need to be monitored closely and potentially the dose reduced. Next slide, please. So um, this is a new medication. We have a lot of information, and yet there's more information that we need. Um, so it's, it's so important that you follow up and discuss the information presented today with your neuromuscular team. They will help you um, with decision making um, and think of things that you may not be thinking about. Um, that team will also submit the prior authorization request to payers that will be necessary. Um, and uh, we will talk about, um, uh, Maynard Fries will talk about uh, what we are doing to for advocacy. But I just want to also plug that um, even if a payer does not have a policy currently, often by submitting a prior authorization request, that will trigger that payer to work on developing a policy for that medication. So even if there's not a policy available, keep moving forward. It will take time, um, as Kenneth uh, mentioned earlier. Um, the other thing that the neuromuscular team is critically important for, uh, and why we really advocate for you to um, uh, see them routinely is that they will monitor for adverse reactions. Um, they'll also monitor for the response to a RISD and optimize those benefits. Um, for example, senior physical therapists working on ways to continue to improve motor strength. They will also keep informed of any new information. And as Kenneth said, we need to learn together more about EVRISD and all of the SMA treatments that are currently available. We need to determine how to best use them um, uh, in, in our community. So again, please work closely with your um, neuromuscular healthcare team. Next slide. So I may have gotten a little bit ahead of myself, um, but uh, what we're looking at with the insurance policies is that typically what we see is that the criteria often are um, in this range between what the FDA label includes um, uh, in comparison to what clinical trials um, included and how they were conducted. So we will um, uh, watch closely as those policies are produced published, made available to us um, for review, and continue to work on educating. I am now going to turn this over to Maynard Fries to speak about this a little bit more detailed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary. So again, my name is Maynard Fries. I handle advocacy and policy for Cure SMA. I wanted to briefly describe our work to ensure that the SMA community can access this new treatment. Last week, just days after the FDA approval, Cure SMA emailed yeah. and mailed letters to all major public and private insurers. The letters we sent educated insurers about the needs of the SMA community, the clinical evidence behind EVRISD, and the need for unrestricted access to this new treatment as outlined through the FDA label. For state Medicaid programs, we wrote to every Medicaid director and also copied the governors of the state given their role in state policy and budgets. Since our outreach, we have received confirmation that our requests have been received and are being reviewed internally by their coverage teams. As far as next steps, Cure SMA will closely monitor action by insurers. For Medicaid plans, we also track public forums, such as meetings of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee related to coverage policy. As those meetings become available, Cure SMA will engage with them by providing public testimony and comments to urge full coverage for the SMA community. Next slide, please. The clinical care team that Dr. Schroth heads tracks the public and private policies once they become available. What you are seeing here is the coverage tracker for EVRISD. It will be filled out in real time as policies become available. Next slide, please. As you can see from this close-up view, the tracker helps us identify and keep track of all policies, but especially those with restrictions that do not match the FDA label. 
This coverage outreach is an ongoing process, as you can imagine. We regularly communicate with payers, especially when new data becomes available to push for full coverage of the treatment. To learn more about our advocacy around coverage or to access any of our letters that we sent to payers on EVRISD, please contact us at advocacy at curesma.org. Thank you. I think I'm gonna turn it back over for uh, questions. Back to Mary. Thank you, Maynard. So I wanted to review future steps for EVRISD. Um, so these are the current clinical trials. So you heard about Firefish. Um, know that um, that clinical trial is fully enrolled and um, data is continuing to be generated from that trial. Sunfish um, is older onset SMA uh, and is also ongoing and uh, is also fully enrolled. Jewelfish, um, you saw very preliminary results uh, from the Jewelfish trial that I sh shared. It is in progress, ongoing. Uh, Rainbowfish, uh, which is pre-symptomatic SMA, uh, birth to six weeks, is also in progress and ongoing. So there is much more to come uh, regarding information about EVRISD. Next slide, please. So these are resources um, uh, at the, on the CuraSMA website to help you um, answer more of your questions. So we have the um, CuraSMA.org EVRISD uh, website. Um, we also have a website about health insurance roadmap um, that you can find under our care series booklets. And then questions on EVRISD or other treatment related inquiries, please email us at treatments at CuraSMA.org. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Schroes, and thank you, Maynard, as well. Um, we're going to close out the presentation with the last few set of questions that were submitted as part of the registration. So if we want to go to the first question, um, will this medication compl be complement to Spinraza treatment? What is the likelihood of someone with SMA receiving both of RISD and Spinraza together in hopes of a greater impact? Based on what we know about the mechanism of action for Spinraza and for EVRISD is that they are similar and overlapping. So at this time, we don't anticipate that's a, that there would be a benefit in uh, giving the medications together. Um, we also have concerns that payers will not, um, uh, not allow that. There's just not enough information to suggest that there's benefit of putting them together. I'll just add on to saying what you're saying there, Mary. So we, we think from that insurance side, it's going to be very difficult to get an insurer to pay for both. Um, and all this really is coming from right now, we just don't know. We just don't have the data, the information to tell us one way or the other, whether this makes sense, whether there's a benefit and also kind of what the risks are. So that'll come over time, but it's just not there right now. Um, again, I think as Mary's saying, you know, our ideas are that it, it might be tough to get more benefit when two drugs are working in a very similar way. Um, and how much more benefit are you going to get? One of the big questions I think out there would be if they work in the same way but in different tissues in the body, do you get a bit more benefit? But we don't know. That's something we're going to have to figure out again in collecting data and doing other studies. Great. Um, the next question we had um, was, have there been any reported drug interactions or contraindications? What medications should not be given with a FRISD? So any medication that uses the MATE uh, transporters, which stands for multidrug and toxin extrusion protein, the MATE. Um, and what happens is that medications that use that pathway, that pathway is disrupted by EVRISD um, so that uh, metabolism is slowed down. And medication examples um, that uh, people in the SMA community may be familiar with are Tagamet, which is a reflux medication, um, ciprofloxacin or cipro, um, and, and possibly metformin. Please uh, review your medications uh, with your healthcare provider at the time you're considering having a prescription for EVRISD. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, the next question is about the process. So what is the process of being monitored while taking EVRISD? 
the FDA did not require specific monitoring. Um, we talked about some of the safety issues um, regarding uh, women who, who are um, considering who, uh, either considering pregnancy or are able to conceive to be um, undergo consider undergoing pregnancy testing. Um, and also if there's concerns about liver function or whether there may, may be liver impairment. Uh, we do recommend that there's close follow-up with your healthcare team. So if you have a, a, a visits every three to six months, continue to do that. We will need close monitoring of, of maintenance of, of progress um, function uh, and or improvement. Thank you. Great. And our, our last question today is about getting started. So how does one get started with the process? Um, it would be helpful if there was some sort of outlined steps. So I would say that the first three steps are to contact your healthcare provider, contact your neuromuscular healthcare provider, contact your neuromuscular team. So start there. Um, uh, starting, uh, considering taking a RISD requires a conversation in my, in my mind and in my experience to talk about um, impact of the medication, what is required to take the medication, um, just different things that are specific to your situation that your healthcare providers will know. Uh, and, um, and the next thing will be to submit a pro if, if it is agreed upon that that is the best pathway, uh, then it is submission of a prior authorization and waiting for that prior authorization to come through. That may require um, appeals, additional education. Um, CureSMA is ready to provide additional education to payers um, to help support uh, um, access uh, per the FDA label for FRISD. I think that's everything that we had here today, and, and we know there's a lot of information slides, and we'll, we'll try and get this out recorded um, and get it available for everybody. We hope this was valuable as kind of a, a first point in time of where we are now with the information that we have right now available for us all. Um, we'll definitely kind of be monitoring this first couple of months of the rollout, and we'll probably come back and give another presentation on how that rollout's gone, especially with the policies and the payers and the insurance coverage. We think that'll move pretty quickly and we'll come back and report on where that is in the short term. And then I think this is longer term. We'll definitely collect questions that you might have in a survey to this webinar. There's questions we obviously all have. You can hear just in this last section, I was talking about longer term combination questions. We're going to be working to collect that data, that information, and be able to hopefully give some good guidance and information on the questions that we all have in the longer term. And so that's still to come, but very exciting time. I think we just wanted to wrap up by saying thank you. Thanks to everybody that participated on this webinar and joined us as well. And a big thank you to just everybody in the community, all those different roles that people took um, over a long time now to get us to this point of this approval. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.